it's great to see everybody. You guys are looking good. You're looking sharp today. Uh, well, if you're visiting, thank you so much for visiting with us. Uh, we're glad that you're here. You, know, you could be anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here. Uh, you know, and, and you're visiting, you probably got here one of two ways. You're either searching for God's church, and if that's you, look no further, because you found it. Hey, you're God's church. Or you stumbled across it. Either way, you're in the right place. Because maybe the third option would be to be dragged here by your parents. Right. And uh, Henry, I got a feeling that's not you. You know, Henry's right over there. Well, anyway, well, well, you've come to not just a, a local church, but you've come to a, a global movement of churches. So right here, we are the uh, West Region of the Chicago International Christian Church. We have an incredible church in Chicago and all over the world. There's there's churches and and other groups meeting just like this right here. We have one goal, and that's to see the world one to Christ. Amen. And uh, I hope that you are open this morning to uh, God's Word and His call on your life. No matter where you are, God has a word for you, and God has a call on your life. He has a purpose for you. All right. So we're going to be out here in Oprah for the next couple of weeks. Are you guys excited about yeah. that? We get in, in the big service. I'm like, I don't even think I saw that person. I if I gave, gave that person a hug. So I'm glad I got a chance to give everyone a hug today. That was, Amen. That was great. So, and uh, and just as uh, the charge I've been given as a shepherd over this group, something I'm very thankful to do. It is uh, my my personal way of doing it is I like to teach in series. I like to do some series so that it sticks. And we just finished up a, a five week series. Amen. That was a that was a humdinger, right? <laughs> We're talking about why we love our church. You know, and we don't want to do anything in vain, so we have some goals for it. We have some goals for our time. Right? We're not going to get up on Sunday morning, you know, come dressed or to worship God, and then just have it go in one ear and out the other. Right? We want to leave with something. We want to leave accomplishing something. So our two goals for the Island of Light Church campaign were to love your church more, to deepen your love for the church. And I believe that we did that. You know, and the second goal was to bring many, many people in so that they would get a chance to love the church. Mm -hmm. I think we still need to work on that one. But I think we, can, we have a lot of things that we can do. Here. Now, if you're visiting, I encourage you to bring your friends out for the next couple weeks. Let them hear the word of God as yeah. well. This is going to be an incredible thing that I want to talk about. Uh, you know, it's going to have some controversy to it. Oh, yeah. It's like anything, you know, I try to give you everything I got. I don't hold it back. That's uh, I don't. And what we're going to be talking about is the Christian life in the 21st century. Oh, and that's going to be the title of the series. Yeah. It's a Christian life in the 24th century. So I'm going to strive with everything I have just to teach you God's Word. And really what it says. And, and so you can understand what it really means for you in your life. But I just want to make some, I'll make some observations and I just want to give them to you about the 21st century. And about this generation. Maybe you noticed them and maybe you haven't. But these are things I want to keep in perspective as you study God's Word. As you understand what it means to live the Christian life in this generation. This is a generation with more ease of communication and travel than any other generation before. Oh, yeah. It's a generation that is socially challenged due to social media, due to our technology, and other things. Yeah. It is a generation of political freedoms. It is a generation with more single moms than ever before. Yeah. It is a generation with a fear of religion. Oh, yeah. It is a generation where ideas are shared and communicated and sent all over the world more openly than ever. It is a generation of individualism, yeah. where self is glorified. Yeah. In the religions that do exist, it is a generation of watered-down, have-it-your-way religion. This is a generation with a smaller proportion of true men, true leaders, than any other generation before. It is a generation with opportunity for financial prosperity. It is a generation of experientialism over materialism. It's no longer what you have, it's what you've done. What you can say, what you can talk about. It's a generation saturated with false Christianity. Come on. It's a generation of political correctness. And it's a generation worn out of movements, political and otherwise. So these are some of the challenges and some of the advantages that we have. But now what are we to do? 
What are we to do as God's people? Yeah. We're going to be studying out the first and second book of Peter. And I just love the books of Peter because Peter really doesn't give any new commands. Right. He doesn't say anything new. He doesn't give any major revelations. He doesn't say anything really profound. But what he says is powerful. Yep. Yeah. And it's to be applied to our lives. And Peter walked with Jesus, who was God in the flesh, who came down and showed us how to live and died for our sins so that we can have a relationship with God. And God wants every person to be in a right spiritual relationship with Him. Yeah. That was the whole point yeah. of sending Jesus. And that requires lordship to His Son. Uh -huh. It is required for that relationship. And those who have made His mission their mission are the people that make up His church. Yep. His call out. The people who have given their lives to His cause. Make up this church. Yeah. Amen. People have been called out to be saved. Who have been called out to be with God in heaven forever. And people who God's power will no longer be separate from them in their lives here on earth because of their sin. But God would walk with them Amen. in spirit. Yeah. Right here, right now. And Peter doesn't write with any fluff, he just gets right to the point. I want to start at the end here. 2 Peter chapter 3. Come on, Marcus. And Peter just reminds us of the fundamentals. He writes here in chapter 3, verse 1 Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the Holy Prophets and the command given to our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. At the end here, Peter writes, why did I do this? Why did I write this to you? He says to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Come on. To recall the scriptures, to recall the Holy Prophets, to recall what was said in the Old Testament. And recall what was spoken by the apostles in the New Testament. It's the fullness of the scriptures. He calls just higher in our mental devotion to God. Yep. Amen. And Peter, after seeing all of it, after, after being called it at a young age, after giving up everything, after seeing the world travel, seeing the word travel throughout the world, he doesn't say, well, let me give him instructions on how to build the church. Let me give him instructions on how to convert people. He didn't even write how to raise any money for missions. <laughs> I wish that some of you <laughs> I wish that you would have wrote that. Right. <laughs> how do I do that, Peter? <laughs> but he didn't do that. He wanted them to set their minds on the Lord. And he knew if he could just do that. Yeah. If he could just get you to focus on God yeah. and God's word, that God's will will be done. That everything will come, come out to plan. Right. So we have three goals. We have three goals of what we want to learn here. Number one is to gain convictions about the Christian life you will live by. That you will live a life of conviction. Number two, that you will set your mind on what God desires. And number three, you will motivate others to live the Christian life in the 21st century. First conviction, hold up or burn up. Come on, come on, get it real. And I hope these are not just things that, again, that you can just recite and things you remember, but I hope that these are things that you take to heart. I'm really begging you, take this to heart. And if, if you couldn't meet with someone or, or you couldn't have a chance to, to meet with disciples or you didn't feel connected that you, that you come back to this. Yeah. That you always would at least have this. Yeah. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Doesn't yeah. that just explain it right there? Yeah. yeah. God is so merciful, so kind, so nice to us yeah. that he gives us another chance. That he gives us another life. He gives us an inheritance in heaven. I don't know if any of you are having an inheritance waiting for you. I don't. I think my mom's got a life insurance policy or something, but I don't have any inheritance waiting for you. But if you did, I guarantee every time you think about it, just make you smile. Right. What am I going to do with all that money? Where am I going to go? Right. You know what God says that the genuine faith will be saved when Jesus Christ comes back. You're going to hear about the second coming of Jesus in this church. Come on. You're going to hear about heaven in this church. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. In the late 1800s, there was a bustling city, an incredible city. And in the middle of trade routes, river routes, people were coming from all over, immigrants, business people, to build and to find prosperity. It was the fastest growing city in the world at that time. That city, in the summer before the fall, had experienced an unpredictable drought, unpredictable heat. And it just left the area so dry. And one night in a barn on the west side of the city, a fire started. And the cause of that fire is not known. But because it was fall and people were storing up wood and coal and different things, different flammable objects. Fire easily spread. Yeah. And that barn was owned by Patrick and Cat Catherine O'Leary, an Irish couple. And they called the fire department. They, they, they panicked. They got them involved. There's a, there's a fire. And the watchman saw it. And he reported, but it was wrongly reported. And by the time the, fire, the fireman got to the barn, it was engulfed in flames. And he had already spread throughout the block. And they tried valiantly to fight this fire. But there was a fire the day before that had left them weary. And they had damaged some of their equipment. And as 30 mile an hour winds started blowing through, the fire started spreading and embers started blowing in the air. And the fire spread rapidly and they couldn't fight it. <coughs> They couldn't fight it, and the fire just began to get so hot, it superheated the air above it. And it created this scientific phenomenon known as a fire vortex. Almost a tornado of fire. Wow. That's just tearing through the villages, tearing through these blocks. Block after block, it's moving. And it's moving toward the river. And people think that the river is going to act as this natural fire barrier. But there's lumber yards built on the banks of the river. And because the river is polluted, there's a film of oil on it and debris. The river catches fire. And the fire jumps the river. Not only is the city on fire, but now the river and the, the fire is tearing into the downtown area. It's tearing into the business district. And they're gathering people from all over to try to help, but the fire is, the fire is burning faster than people can run. Yeah. And it gets near the courthouse, and the fire started at 9, 8, 9 p.m. in the barn. And it rages 11 p.m., and it's raging through the night, and it's nearing the courthouse, and the mayor orders all the prisoners to be released. And people are running in the streets, they're panicking. There's animals stampeding everywhere. Prisoners are released. 
People being burned, bricks crumbling. And the closest thing to hell you would ever experience on earth. And the city's water pump is still trying to pump water in, but because it's made of wood, the roof collapses and lodges it drying up, unable to fight the fire. And the fire burns and it burns and it burns through the night. And it jumps the river again to go to the north side of the city. And it tears through four square miles. Complete devastation. And the fire started on October 8th, and it burned through the night, and it burned through the morning, and it burned through the day of October 9th. And then finally that night, a cold front came in. And as the fire began to wear itself out because there was nothing more to burn, it had burned through everything. Because the city was, was bustling, and the city was new, and they had to put it up quickly, so everything was made of wood. So it was cheap, and even though the buildings on the outside were made of brick, inside they were all framed out with wood. And the sidewalks were made of wood. And the streets were even made of wood. And roofs were made of highly flammable tar. And the fire was able to spread so rapidly. In the end, a third of the city's population was left homeless. In a city of 300,000 people, 100,000 people were left homeless. It was reported that 300 people died, but that's all that was reported. Complete devastation. Completely staggering. But there was a building in that downtown district yeah. that did survive. That's the building on that piece of paper right there. Yeah. That's the Chicago Water Tower that stands in the downtown district of Chicago. And that building is made of stone. Yeah. It withstood the inferno. Why did I tell you that story? Because the fire is the trials, the challenges, and the conflicts that you will face if you decide to give your life to God. If you decide to become Christ's disciple. And the water tower represents the genuine faith of one who can withstand it. What are you made of? Do you lose your purpose with financial challenges? Do you stop loving people when your health fades? Do you stop giving your time, your energy, your money when people hurt you? Yeah, when your life isn't where you thought it would be by this point, do you turn to sin? Come on. Do you even blame God for the fight? Yeah, come on. So how do you stand? It's with a firm foundation. Right. Just like that building. Made of immovable rock. In other words, it's the elementary teachings. It's a foundation. It's the basics. It's the first principles. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, it says you ought to know well enough to teach it. Yeah. How do I know if you know well enough to teach it? Are you teaching it? To your friends, your family, yeah. to the coworkers, those around you. And Hebrews, the sixth chapter, first verse, and we move on, I'm going to read it to you real quick. It says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ, and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation yeah. of repentance from acts that lead to death, yeah. of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. <coughs> How about it? Repentance. Can you give me book, chapter, and verse right. for what it means? How about baptism? Can you give me book, chapter, and verse? Faith in God. Can you give me book, chapter, and verse? You have to know the scriptures. Yeah. Come on. It's from God. It's been handed down from God. It's been protected through the ages, through the centuries to give to us. Yeah. Come on. It's a command of God. Yeah. And it's the command I give you now. Yeah. Okay. To know it. Because without it, your foundation will be rocky. Right. Come on. And the closer you get to being saved, the hotter the fire is going to get. There you go. 
Satan does not want anybody to be saved. And the closer you are toward the end, the more that inferno is going to come on you. Will you stand? Come on. God desires holiness. Yep. It's the second conviction. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy as I am holy. It's so powerful. He wants us to set our minds on the second coming of Jesus Christ. How radical is that? Just picture Jesus Christ coming back to get you. Coming back to get his obedient children. Amen. When he says, don't conform to the world. Don't be like them. You did that when you didn't know. We didn't know any better. But now we're to be holy. We're to be set apart. And I think we really need some teaching on this. Because that's what it means. The Bible's clear. God says, be holy as I am holy. It's to live a set-apart lifestyle. To a lifestyle that's not mixed in with the world that has another purpose. You know, there's no such thing as being holier than thou. I've heard that all the time. You're either holy or you're not. You're either set-apart or you're not. You're either saved or you're not. You haven't been born again in your heaven. You're either following Jesus or you're not. No such thing as a good disciple and a bad one. You either are one or you're not. Yep. Come on. You're in a lighter in your darkness. Yep. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, in an age of political correctness, people aren't going to accept that message. We want to talk about that for a little bit. You know, that's a, a term that has become part of our lexicon. It's become part of uh, our speech, and we hear it so often, have we not? Yeah. Have we not heard that? I mean, that, that was not something that was said, you know, 100 years ago. That was something that came about in the, uh, in the 80s and the 90s, and then it's progressively been used more and more. And, and really what it is, it's just uh, an idea that we use language and we create policies and procedures and all the other different types of things that try to avoid uh, offending anybody or try to avoid uh, saying anything that might be looked at as unfair for those who are maybe less fortunate. Right. Hey, this is a complex political theory, and I'm not here to give you any political theories, but we know it. Yeah. We know it's out there. We, we feel the, the weight of that yeah. on society. Yeah. You know, I think we, we know so many people that are maybe like, well, you know, I'm not afraid to be politically incorrect. Well, let me ask you, when was the last time you said something that was politically incorrect? When was the last time you ruffled some feathers? Right. Come on. You know, when was the last time you ruffled some feathers for Jesus? Right. That, that, that's the call. You cannot be politically correct to follow God. Come on. You can't do it. No, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a funny story. Uh, you know, November 2nd of last year, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> not a whole lot of Cubs fans here. <laughs> that's okay. Not a lot of Cubs fans. That's all right. And you know, we, we thought, uh, you know, Mrs. Uh, O'Leary's barn was a legend. I mean, man, the Cubs win a World Series, that's a legend. Right. That was a heck of a legend right there. That hadn't happened. I don't know which came first, the fire or the, or the Cubs winning. <laughs> you know, and I remember just seeing, uh, you know, and I work in Wrigleyville, and uh, you know, I just see everyone was just so happy. It was just like one big family. Everyone was like, oh, just hugs. Hugs all around. We did it. We made it, you know, as if they played on the team. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, just everyone, just the joy, just the joy in everyone's eye. And then I, I just remember a, a few days later, November 8th, Donald Trump was elected president. <laughs> on Tuesday night, I remember just Wednesday morning, everybody come in. <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, didn't you see what happened? I was like, yeah, but I'm feeling great today. I don't know what's wrong with you. 
But just see, everyone just down. Everyone just down, and ah, this is bad. This is not good. <laughs> as if their life all of a sudden changed overnight, as if they made less money, or lived in a different place, or you know, who knows? And just see that. What is? What are people living for that's out there? Right. You know, and I remember my, I have I have my Bible talk. I'll set up that week. I have my Bible talk on Friday. You know, want to just bring people in and just let them discuss the word. And I said, you know what? I'm changing my Bible talk. I'm going to talk about this. And I just laid out that scripture that says that God ordains all the human government and all the authorities and everything else like that. Come on. And I said, hey, this is what God says about it. Yeah. People are like, what? What are you saying that God, you know, you know and it, yeah, I, had to, I had to get a little politically incorrect yeah. Yeah. at that time. I tell you what, I had some visitors at Bible Talk, had no problem getting people there that, that week. <laughs> you, know, you know what it's like, getting, you know, trying to, trying to get people just together and just discuss yeah. the word. It's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just do it every week and people are like, oh, Bible Talk. Yeah. Yeah. Bible. The Bible's really not my thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's just... When you give people an opportunity to talk about something. Yeah. You know, and I let people talk. I let them talk. And then I brought it back to the Bible. Yeah. I said, here's what God says. Here's what God Now what are you going to do? Are you going to do the right thing? Are you going to make an excuse? Are you going to do down? Are you going to mope? Are you going to mope around? It's the truth. <laughs> right. I don't know. I said, this is the greatest country in the world. Yeah. It is. It is. You know, are you going to take a stand for Jesus? Come on. Come on. Right. Yeah. When you hear conversations, are you going to say something? Are you going to interject? Jesus never missed a teachable opportunity. They are all over the place. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to share my opinion. Just listen to any conversation that's happening. Listen to anything that's going on. If you know your Bible well enough, you will see the opportunity to teach. Yeah. Amen. You are God's children. Yeah. Yeah. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You are to be an obedient learner of Jesus Christ. You have authority to teach the Bible in any and every situation. Yeah. There is no law. There is no policy. There is no country. There is no anything yeah. that goes above God's law. Right. You have full jurisdiction. Yeah. Now the question is, are you using it? That's what it means to be a Christian in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're not a disciple, if you haven't been made holy by God, we can teach you. Amen. We can teach you the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. We can teach you the Bible so you can have that power. That's right. excited about that one. Amen. The third conviction is love that lasts. First Peter, verse 22, chapter 1. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and the glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Yeah. And this is the word that is preached to you. You know, Peter gives us some perspective here. He tells us what's, what's happening. Man, he's, he's writing to the Christians. He's writing to the people who are already saved. He said, you've been purified by obeying the truth. Now love one another. Deeply. Yeah. Other translations say fervently. Love each other fervently from the heart. That's enthusiastically. It's an enthusiastic love. Come on. It's passionately. It's with great warmth. Right. With great intensity of spirit. That's the love that God wants us to have. Yep. You why? Because everything is perishing. That's what he says. He says, do this. Because all people are like grass. Yeah. At the end of it, what's, what's really going to last? You know, in a, in a, in a 
time and a generation where everyone wants to make their mark. Right? With more freedoms and more opportunities, everyone wants to step up. Yeah. Everyone wants to step up and make their mark. Yeah. Was to start a company or have their name on a building or have many children so that their name endures forever. <laughs> What's it going to matter? When there's no earth, there's going to be no one to even remember anything at all. And Peter's like, this is why we love. This is why we love here. How can I love somebody, not love somebody, if I know that they're perishing? How could that possibly be? And I know that, that someone is perishing. I know that they're separated from God for eternity. I know what that means. I know what that means in the Bible. How can I not love that person? Hate them and then find a hatred. And then let them go to hell. Wow. Add insult to injury? And then think I could be saved? Mm. Come on. You understand what Jesus is talking about? What it means to love your enemies? Yep. You never understand what it means to love your enemies until you want the entire world to be a Christian. Right. You never get it. It's like at the end of it, it's just like, doesn't matter. You hate me, I don't care. You know, we love you. What do you need for you? Whatever I got. Whatever time, whatever I have, just give it to you. Yeah. Because at least you could have that. Yeah. At least you could have that right now. Yeah. And maybe that kindness will get you to repent. Yeah. Just maybe. But God's word endures forever. Yeah. Who says this is the word that was preached to you? It takes us. It takes us to do that. You know, I feel like I've done so little in my life. I've been been a Christian now only two years and in several months, and I'm going to be turning 30 in January. Oh wow! I mean, that comes by fast. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that stuck up on me real quick. I remember I, I hadn't celebrated a birthday since I was like 16 years old. I mean, I hadn't said I was bitter. I was just a bitter, angry dude. Just nasty. You know, like a, you're supposed to be happy on your birthday. I was like, I want to be happy. So, so I never celebrated it. You know, and, and it was two years ago, I was born on January 28th. <laughs> and so I, I, I celebrated my birthday for the first time in 12 years, on my, on my golden birthday. Yeah, and it was only a, a few months after becoming a disciple, I became a disciple in May of that year. And uh, that was the year uh, I actually was able to, to open my gym. I started with uh, a few partners, and that was a time that I that I actually felt like like my life is, is going somewhere. It was because I had given my life to God. I had given my life to God, and, and He was now straightening my path. Yeah. And finally, I felt like my life had direction at that at that time. Yeah. You know what? I, didn't, didn't do a whole lot last year, but now I'm like, this year is going to be my third. I have got more gray hairs <laughs> this year. I, I had one maybe last year. I had one. I got a whole bunch of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to get a few more. And I just, it just puts in such perspective for me. I, just, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know where I'm going to go. You know, I know it's coming fast. Yeah. It's coming up fast. And uh, I just try to love every single person. And I don't do it perfectly every time. But this, this is on my heart. I've set my mind on this. And this is what Peter wants us to do. Peter says, you gotta, you got to keep it in perspective. you got to remember. you got to remember the fundamentals. you got to remember where you came from. You need to remember what's going to happen. Remember that Jesus is coming back. Remember that everything will eventually perish. Understand these things. Don't deny anybody your time. 
Don't deny anybody your time. Don't deny anybody anything. Jesus said, give to those who ask of you. Give to those who ask. Someone asks for your time, if you can't do it then, you make sure you give them the time. You find time to give them the time. But if someone asks you financially, don't hold back. Don't hold back for them. And maybe you don't give a loan, but maybe say, you know, this is what I can give to you. This is what I can give to you from my heart. And give to every person. Give that love to every single person with the love that wants them to know God. That's the, that's the purest love that you can give anybody. Is be willing to lay down your life so that they can know God. That's the definition of love. That's the definition of love in the Bible. That's what it means. That's how we know that God had loved us. This is how we know Jesus Christ laid down his life. For us, we have to lay down our lives. For, for the brothers and sisters. You know, I got into a, you know, a study and I got into some, some conversations uh, with some people and you know, it ended up uh, just getting to that point of trying to, trying to reach out and trying to pull somebody back in that we've done some studies, done some great studies with and you know, I'd spent some time with or I went to the gym with or I'm loved, I'm just trying to get to know I'm giving it everything I had. Every single thing I had. Then just didn't hear from a few days and called and trying to leave my heart. Try to just leave my heart that voice from him. And a few days later, just get a super long text. He says, you know what, I've gotten some Christian counsel and I don't want to study anymore. I said, you know what, that's sad. Because if we're brothers, you're supposed to die for me and I'm supposed to die for you. And I said, if I'm wrong, the least you can do is have a study with me. But you don't even have the courage to do that. Wow. And that's the life that we live in. Yep. Yeah. So skewed. So skewed from the Bible. Yep. How can someone who believes to be a brother in Christ believes me to be a brother in Christ and will walk away from me and think that's acceptable? Yeah. Come on. Wow. But that's what you're called to. That's the type of life that you're called to. That's the interactions that you must have to bring people to the Lord. Yeah. Don't be discouraged. The millions are not going to follow God. No. There's a few who will. Yeah. And that's what, that's what God's after. Yeah. Not everything's going to stand. Not everything's going to make it to the end. You know, and I, I hope that everyone in this room does. But I know the reality. I know the reality is that I won't. And we won't see you quick. How much more should we love them? Right. That's right. How much more should we should we really love them? We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Boy, I sure would want myself to be saved. You know, Paul said, I just wish myself a curse. A curse cut off from Christ. If he just meant the salvation of Israel. Look how much he loved him. He didn't care about his own salvation. Sent his own self to hell. For the salvation of Israel. Why do we accomplish little? And Paul accomplished so much. Because he loved so much. Yeah, yeah. And we love so little. You know, I want every person in here, every single person in here, to know God in a deep way. Yeah. And to know the great things He has for your life. Yeah. The incredible things that He has for you. That are just, they're just waiting. They're waiting for all of you. you know, and if you don't know what it means to be born again, we're done. You come forward, you see us, you ask. You ask the questions. Let us help you. Let us help you make that decision. So you can be with God forever. I love you guys. God be the glory. Yeah.